Well, good morning again. If you have a copy of the Bible with you, some form or fashion, let me invite you to open up with me to the Gospel of John this morning. We will spend uh, the majority of our time together here now as we uh, reflect on God's Word. We'll be in John's Gospel. So if you want to go ahead and be turning there, uh, we'll dive into John 1 and look at uh, a passage there in just a moment. Uh, every year, the people over at Oxford Dictionaries, they, they select a word that they choose as their international word of the year. I've been doing this now for the past several years, and in 2016, they selected a word that, uh, that they noticed a, a, a real spike in its usage. In fact, from 2015 to 2016, the people at Oxford said that this one particular word had increased in usage some 2,000 percent. And a lot of that had to do with some political things that were happening in the world that year, an election here on this side of the Atlantic, and then the, uh, the UK's decision to leave the European Union on, on the other side of the Atlantic. And so uh, this word was used a lot more. And that word is a word that you, we may not use as much anymore, I don't know, but it's, it's the word post-truth. You ever heard this word? Again, it's used a lot of times in, in political context. but. But this word has, has sort of emerged in the last few years as, as a word that you hear more and more often. Uh, and it kind of describes this situation where, where we find ourselves today, where oftentimes facts take a back seat when people are, are determining things, making decisions or whatever. The, the objective facts matter less and less than maybe they ever did, at least in the minds of some. And what matters more is it's not whether something is true or not, but, but that you feel that it's true. <laughs> that the, the, the feeling that you have about something is what is really determinative. So as uh, 400 years ago, Rene Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. And it's been noted that in our time, it seems as if there's been a shift. That line has been replaced. Instead, it's, it's now we're living more in the times of I feel, therefore I am. Of course, the, the reality is we're, we're not living in any kind of post-truth culture, no matter what Oxford says. The truth matters today more than it ever has before. But I think, I think we all can feel uh, a certain shift in our, in our times because uh, it seems as if there's so many lies that we encounter in our world that it makes it difficult sometimes to really know what's true. Can you relate to that? that there are times when, when things happen and, and in, in times gone by, maybe we would just have accepted something as, as being true, this proposition or, you know, because this authority figure says it or whatever. But now it's, it seems as if we're in more of a time when, when everything, every claim is viewed so skeptically and so suspiciously because we know there are so many lies in our world today. So a week ago, not yesterday, but the Saturday before, like many of you, I got, a, I got, got a, a, a text message from a friend that said, seems as if there's been an assassination attempt on President Trump's life. He's at a rally, a campaign rally in Pennsylvania, and I get this message. And my first reaction upon reading that was this little, this little thought flashed in my mind, like, okay, is this real or not? Can you relate to that? I, I just, you know, read this and I think, okay, is this, is this really happening or is this just, uh, you know, some bot in Russia that's produced this lie and sent it out and AI makes this more of a challenge now too in the times that we live in. So I, I'm certainly not saying we live in a post-truth culture like some people want us to believe, but I do believe that we live in a world filled with so many lies that it can make it oftentimes really difficult for us to know what's true and what's not. So we're going through this series right now entitled God of All, and we're looking at these places in the scriptures that describe God's character in these all-encompassing terms. And Lee kind of mentioned it a moment ago as we were looking through that passage there in John 1 before we sang uh, that, that beautiful song. I can tell you that everything I want to say today, I can summarize it in this one 
sentence. This is everything I hope to say today. In a world full of lies, God is the source of all truth. That is everything that I want to say today. Some of you are thinking, great, sit down, let's go. Let's get out of here. Shortest sermon, greatest sermon I've ever heard you preach, Jason. No, I have more to say. But the, the idea here, again, is that in our world filled with so much deception, in a place like, you know, we don't oftentimes know where to go for the truth, let it be said that our God is the source of all truth. And I believe that this is most evident when you look to John's gospel. And so that's what I want us to do in the time we have remaining here today, uh, to spend some time looking at a few key passages from the gospel of John. So you're there in John chapter 1. Let's go directly to verse 14. And this is where we'll begin here today. John 1, starting in verse 14. This is what God's Word says, speaking about Jesus. It says, And the Word became flesh, and it dwelt among us, John said. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And then this line that I've underlined, full of grace and truth. John begins his gospel so differently than the other gospel writers, whereas Matthew and Luke are interested in the genealogy of Jesus, kind of giving you a little bit of the backstory and the history leading up to his birth. Mark, on the other hand, just jumps right into the action. He has Jesus out in the wilderness and he's baptized and away we go. John gets this kind of cosmic view of Jesus and he says that he was in the beginning that he was the word, he is the logos, that, that the Son of God was with God and that he was God. He's in, in the very form and, and, and nature that he took on. He is fully divine and fully human and so he gets into this mysterious relationship between God the Father and God the Son and, and so he says then this word came from heaven and it, and it took on flesh. Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. So when God said, let there be, Jesus was involved in that. Jesus is the creative agent, the power at work when God speaks. That's who he is as the Word of God. Think about that. When Jesus teaches, people are moved because they say he's, he's teaching as one who has authority. We've never heard anyone teach like this, they said. Well, no wonder, because you've never heard the Word of God in flesh, in your midst. But that's who Jesus is. And he says that his coming was glorious. There's glory that comes through the, uh, the, the incarnation of Jesus, the miraculous deeds that he accomplishes, the way he changes people's lives, even to this very day. We were celebrating a minute ago with Andy and Drew right here on the stage. The fact that once again, God's Word has done what it's been doing now for a couple of thousand years, and that's transforming people's hearts and lives. And that is a glorious thing to behold. And, and John says then, then that Jesus has come, and he has this beautiful blend. He's come full of grace and truth. Last week we looked at 1 Peter chapter 5 and we we're talking about how God is the God of all grace. And so John reiterates that. He says Jesus comes full of grace, but not just grace, he's also full, he says, of truth. And Jesus holds those two things in a perfect sense of balance. And that balance is so essential. Think about this with me. All truth and no grace, what does that look like? Jesus holds truth and grace in balance, but if you get imbalanced in one direction or another, what, what does that do? What does that look like? So all truth and no grace can, can be a little bit harsh, you know? Have you ever known someone who kind of prided themselves on being that person who, who you know, maybe, maybe they love to say, I, I just tell it like it is, you know? I like that just sort of excuses the, the, like the, the, the most harsh and cruel things that somebody says. Like, hey, look, I just tell it like it is. You know, there's some of us, we kind of take pride in that, you know? 
We want to be known as that person who's brash and bold and maybe sometimes blunt. Um, and and that I believe, I want to believe that comes from a really good place because it comes from a place of placing a premium on the truth. That's a good thing. But sometimes when we, you know, fall all over us, ourselves to tell it like it is, we, we sort of lose sight of the fact that tone is really important and compassion is really important. I tell you, you know, I think I've always had a problem sometimes with tone. I remember my mom telling me this when I was a child, you know, hey, your tone, Jason, you know. And nothing cures your tone more than getting married because you constantly hear, Jason, tone, your tone. Like, I can't tell you how many times Sonny has had to tell me that, you know. So I'm hard headed and finally it's kind of sinking in. But, you know, sometimes you got to remember, okay, compassion, your tone, those things are important. And so truth is always supposed to be balanced out, tempered with, with grace. And you see that in Jesus. But then if you go to the, to the other extreme and, it, and it's all grace and no truth, well, then that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. And there's some problems there too. Someone who leans too far in that direction, uh, they can be overly affirming, you know? They can, they can overlook people's faults to a fault, <laughs> you know? You just be so, you know, overly uh, uh, affirming and excusing everything, this effort to be loving and kind, and such a person might never, never hold someone accountable for their actions, which can actually enable them in their sin, which is not a loving thing to do. And in the gospel of Jesus Christ, things like truth-telling and accountability are every bit as important as compassion and grace. And so thankfully in Jesus, we see this perfect balance. He holds these things together, grace and truth. He's full of them, John says, meaning that he is filled to completion when it comes to these things. So yes, he is the God of all grace, but he is also the God of all truth. In that great commission, he says that we make disciples by teaching them to obey whatsoever things I have commanded you, he says. And why is that important for a disciple-making mission? It's important for us to know the basis of truth. It's really important for us to know that when Jesus speaks, his words are true. He is filled with all truth. And that leads us to the next passage in John's gospel I'd like for us to look at. If you'll just go forward a couple of chapters, turn with me here to John chapter 8. And let's look at verses 31 and 32. There's another teaching in John's gospel about truth as it relates to Jesus, it's really important. John 8, 31 and 32. I may need your help up in the booth too because I think I may be dead in the water here with this guy, thank you. So um, John 8, 31 and 32, this is what it says. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay, this is one of those passages that I think a lot of people have heard. I think a lot of people know this line. They might even know that it goes back to Jesus. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of people know that line. They've heard that line before. But I think, honestly, a lot of times we miss out on what Jesus is actually saying here. So you can see it clear as day. Jesus begins by saying that if we abide in his word, then we are his disciples. What does it mean? What is he, what is he saying? Well, to abide means what? What would you say? To, to abide means to live somewhere, right? Your, your abode is your home. So to, to abide somewhere is, it's the place where you live. You, you dwell there. And so he's saying here that to, to abide in his word is to live there. It's to, to dwell in his word. It's, it's also a place where we take our stand. We stand here. This is where we belong. This is what it means to abide. It's not to move away from, but it is to stand firm and resolute within. So you abide in your promises. You abide in a covenant promise when you say, I do. You know, he's like, I'm going to stand here. I'm not going to go stand there. I'm not going to walk off. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be right here. You know, that's what it means to abide in that promise. And so in the same way, when we come to faith in Jesus, 
He says, if you're my disciples, then here's what you'll do. You'll abide in my word. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? You're going to like perfectly obey his word? You're never going to make a mistake? No. That's the case. He's not going to have any disciples at all, right? But there is a general principle at work here that generally speaking, you can abide in his word. That means to the best of your ability, you're trying to obey. You're not trying to walk in darkness. You're not trying to walk in sin. It's the same thing, you know, to walk in the light as he is in the light. Does that mean you will never, ever, ever experience any little bit of darkness because of your own sinful temptations and choices? No, it's not about perfection. There is a general orientation of your heart once you have repented and you give your life over to Jesus. There is such a thing as like walking in the light. And generally speaking, everything I'm trying to do, I'm trying to pursue you, Lord. I'm trying to learn from my mistakes. I'm trying to grow in Christ-likeness. And abiding in his word is a big piece of that. So we should inhabit the word of God. It should be our dwelling place. It's where we stand. And that's really important because there is power in the word of God. There's power in there to recreate us to make us new, to transform us. The the Word of God has this eternal power and it can transform us for eternity. So if you'll go to the next slide for me, 1 Peter chapter one says this. We'll just have a little sidebar into what Simon Peter says. I want you to see this. He says in 1 Peter 1, 23 and 24, you have been born again. Common language to us, we understand what that is referring to, you know, born again Christians, that's a phrase that rings in our ears. But think about what he says here. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, we're all born that way, but of this imperishable, this this life that can't be taken from you, eternal life, okay? So he's talking about coming to Jesus, he's talking about having your sins washed away, he's talking about being baptized, receiving the Holy Spirit, and again, generally speaking, walking in the light and abiding in his word. So if you've been born again like that, he says, through the living and abiding word of God, the word of God has this power to recreate you, to give new life to you. Again. Drew, you're sitting up front, so I have to always kind of use you as the example. You better pay attention, man, you know. Got to get your dad a, family, a Father's Day gift, too. Come on, what are we, what are we doing? Um, when, sorry. Whenever you know, we're up here with Drew, we're giving him this Bible, you know. What is that all about? You know, it's, it's, it's more than just getting him up on the stage. A lot of us have known the Kimbros forever. We've known Drew since he was a baby. But we get him on this stage and we give him this Bible because we believe That God has not just started something in his heart, in his life, whenever he gave his life to Jesus in baptism. But we believe that there's power in that word to recreate, to continue to make him a new creation. Because that's our story, right? That's the reason we're drawn to the power of God's word in the first place, you know? Because it will make us new. And that's not just us talking about, that's, that's clear as day. It's in black and white in our Bibles, You've been born again through the living and abiding word of God. So when you abide there, you're his follower, you're his disciple, and you are made new. There's power to recreate you there. And he says that power comes from the eternal nature of God's word. But the word of the Lord, it says, remains forever. So there's this rebirth that comes when we stand in the word of God. Because his word stands forever. Jesus says it this way over in Matthew chapter 24. He says, heaven and earth will pass away. Do you remember this one? He says, heaven and earth, they're going to fade away. All of it is going to be redone. It's all going to pass away. You think you know heaven and earth. Let me tell you, it's passing away. But my word, he says, will never pass away. The word of Jesus will never fade It will not pass away. I don't know what we're going to be doing in heaven, you know, but it seems like one of the things we might be doing is reflecting on the wisdom and the glory and the power of the word of God because the word of God never fades away. Everything else might, but the word of God stands. So to be a disciple of Jesus is to make your stand on the eternal word of God. That means you're not ashamed of his word. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God to make me new again, to make righteous that which is unrighteous. I'm not ashamed of that. 
Sometimes I wonder, are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we ashamed of the word of God? Are, we embar- are there parts of God's word that are embarrassing to you? Parts of God's word that you just kind of want to tamp down. Parts of God's word where we say, you know, I, I just kind of hope, uh, hope my neighbor doesn't want to talk about that part of the Bible because I don't really have a great answer. That part, I kind of just, I wish that Jesus didn't say that or I wish God didn't put that in. Are, are there parts of that? Like, that's not something we talk about very often in church, but I have to wonder, you know. Are there parts of God's word that we're ashamed of or that, that we're embarrassed by because they're out of step with our culture today? And is being in step with our culture today so important that we would actually be ashamed of the eternal word of God that, that lasts forever? I mean, maybe pray about that. Think about that. There have been times in my life I would have to say, yeah, there, there are certain parts of God's word that, you know, I wouldn't want to talk to uh, uh, this certain person about that. If they, if they had an objection, you know, about, about that part of God's word, you know, that would kind of give me a little bit of pause. What are they going to think if we stand for this that doesn't affirm them in all these different ways? And, and I needed to repent of that, you know. <laughs> I really did. I take no pride in saying that to you because you deserve better from this, you know. So I was just telling you, like that hits home for me. I think about the, uh, the word of God lasts forever. And we ought not be ashamed or embarrassed to, to stand on the authority of God's eternal word. That's what saved us. It's what gives us life, you know. And so if that means that sometimes we're a little bit out of step with the world, you know what? We're not going to be the first Christians to ever be that way. You read the book of Acts, it seems like it comes with the territory for a lot of our brethren. There's something to think about, something to pray about. And when we abide in his word as his disciples, then he says in that line from John, that's when the truth sets you free. His commands are not a heavy burden. No, remember what he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The truthfulness of, of his word sets us free. But we, we might ask, okay, sets us free from what? You will know the truth. If you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So the question is, what is Jesus talking about? Sets us free from what exactly? If the truth sets us free, then it stands to reason that there is a bondage that comes about because of the lies that we believe. If you'll go to the next slide for me, guys. The lie will enslave but the truth will set you free. I think that's, that first part is obviously my words, you know, but just trying to flesh out what Jesus says there, what's implicit when he says the truth will set you free, he says it's free from what? From the lies of the evil one. From the lies that, that we buy into, that lead us to sin, that, that so easily entangle us, that, that's the story that the Bible tells from the very beginning. You go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and you find Satan manipulating the truth and you find him spinning his lies and those lies are destructive and and they're powerful and they have the, the power to really inflict a lot of damage. And that's why Satan traffics in lies the way that he does. Satan does this because lies lead to sin. They do. Lies will lead us directly into sin. Like we talked about this last week, you know, sin is one of the most powerful forces in in, in the world because it has the power to change you. It's not really the, the way God intended for things to be in the beginning, but now sin has entered into the world and we see its destructive power. Sin has a lot of power in the sense that it can change you and it can transform you. Sin will turn you into someone you were never intended to be. Have you witnessed that before? You think about it from God's perspective. He made you to be, you know, this person. He created good works in advance for you to pursue, Ephesians 2, verse 10. He created you, you know, for life with God. So so that means he created you for life apart from sin. But sin infects all of us. It's the pandemic that we all, you know, have been through. We we all are, uh, are, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, it says in in, in Romans. So so sin will, will then begin its work. 
And it'll warp us and it'll corrupt us and it'll, it'll twist us and we become different people. We become a, you become a different person when sin runs its course through you. It'll build up a desire for more sin, which then becomes all-consuming, and it'll change you and not in a good way. And Jesus goes on to say of Satan in John chapter 8, says he was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Listen to what Jesus says. When Satan lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Does that mean all lies at their root come from the evil one? If he's the father of lies, does that mean every lie in the world, you drill down you know, long enough, eventually it's going to lead you back to the kingdom of evil, right? And if our God is the God of all truth, I mean, this, this is the battle in our culture. It's the battle in, throughout history determining the truth from the lie. It goes all the way back to the garden itself. Satan is the father of lies, and his lies continue to enslave us to this very day. He's convinced a lot of people to reject the authority of God's word. As Jesus says, he doesn't stand in the truth. He wants to drag as many people down with him as possible. And one of the most popular lies that Satan tells today is that your identity is tied to something like your sexuality. You see that today is the cause of a lot of deception and a lot of wickedness in our culture. He's used this same lie to lead people to redefine something sacred like marriage. Marriage is a sacred covenant that comes from God and God alone. You know, we didn't invent marriage, so we don't have the right to redefine it according to cultural norms and standards. We don't have the right to redefine something that God himself has given and defined, but Satan didn't care about that. And his lies lead us into great arrogance to think that we can name something, change something that God set from on high. Satan continues to lie to us through things like radical gender ideology and transgenderism. Those are lies. It's a, it's a lie. Transgenderism is the lie that you can play God. Now you get to choose the category of your gender a lie. I have Rosaria Butterfield writes that at the root of transgenderism is the sin of envy. I think she's onto something there. She says it's the sin of envy. It's wanting that which you cannot have, that which is not yours to claim. And that, according to the Bible, is sin. And the lies of Satan don't just end there with, you know, cultural hot button issues. Uh, his lies, you know, he, he wants us to just be so indifferent to the suffering of others. You read through the Gospels, Jesus is really clear that he expects his followers to care for those people who are in need, the poor, the needy, those who are around. He says, you know, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. He goes on and on, you know, from there. But, but Satan wants us to be so self-absorbed. We don't even notice the needs of the people in our own community and those around us. And in the teaching of Jesus there, the king in that story, he says to those who don't care for the least of their brothers, he says, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's from Jesus, y'all. <laughs> Satan is the father of lies. And he wants nothing more than to enslave us. And that's exactly what happens when you exchange the truth for a lie, as Paul describes in Romans. But the truth resides with God. And indeed, the truth, he says, will set us free from all of those attempts to enslave. If you go to the next slide for me, please. I want, you, I want us to close by looking at this, this final text in John's gospel, John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. 
Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house. There are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be. And you know the way to where I'm going. The next slide. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is just before his trial. Uh, Jesus knows that his disciples are going to be confused when all this happens. And so he gives them this teaching. If you go to that last slide. And he says here that the truth will guide you home. That's kind of the gist of what he's getting at here in these critical moments with his followers. He says, the truth is the way home. The truth is the way to the Father. You don't make it home to the Father by believing the lies of Satan. You make it home by walking in the way of truth. And that way is known as Jesus. So Jesus tells his disciples again that he's leaving and he's going to go prepare a place. And Thomas, you know, after Jesus says, you know the the way to where I'm going. Thomas is like, hey, time out. No, we don't. We don't know where you're going. Can you explain this a little bit more? And that's what Jesus says. I'm the true path, Thomas. You know the way because you know me. And I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the life. He was like, I'm the true path to everlasting life. And that's a claim that bothers a lot of people today. In our postmodern world, our post-truth culture, whatever, you know, we're not accustomed to someone um, maybe speaking in such authoritative terms, you know. We don't like those exclusive claims, you know. To say, yeah, it's, it's either this way or nothing, you know, people are very much bothered by those kinds of statements today. We, we, we like a world with options, don't we? We like a world with customizable options. Um, We like to believe that all paths are equal, you know? How do you get there from here? Eh, Any way you want, you know? As if there's some destination out there that you could ever arrive to by just going any, any direction you want. Pick any path, walk any direction you want, and you'll get there. If, if you asked for directions and someone told you that, would, what would you do? Half of us are men, so I would never have to be in that situation. It's probably what you're thinking, you know? I don't ask for directions. Um, man, you guys are asleep. Wow. Um, <laughs> I'll stick to the Bible. Um, if anybody in your life told you, yeah, I want to tell you how to get somewhere, and they said, just take any path you want, and eventually it's going to lead you. You would think, no, that's not true. But for some reason, when it comes to our spiritual lives, we tend to think, some will think, some, that this is like a popular thought, just any path will do. They all lead to the same place, so it doesn't matter. Religion, your path, you know, Jesus, Buddha, you know, no God, you know, whatever, just it's all going to end in the same kind of place. And Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth of all things. And it's all about him. And it always has been and it always will be. And for us, if someone does that, sure, we might think that sounds kind of like arrogant or off-putting. Because you don't know anyone who is the truth of all things. There's, you don't know anyone who can actually say that with authority. But what if Jesus really is the truth of all things? Right? Th- then he has to say that. Or else he wouldn't be true. You know, what if it's really true that Jesus is the only path to eternal life? The only way to get home is to cross the bridge that Jesus built through his death and his burial and his resurrection. The gospel revealed in Jesus begins with that little bit of hard news. We are far from home. Because of our sin, we are in need of reconciliation. We are far from God, far from his will. And what we have incurred because of our own choices, it's wrath and judgment. 
Have you noticed every time you try to take control of your life and say, okay, God, I'm just going to leave you here. I'm going to do things my way. Have you noticed how quickly you make a wreck of your life? Have you noticed that? If you haven't noticed it yet, maybe this is a warning because it's coming. Because we were not built for that kind of freight. We, we cannot call the shots and always get it right and always walk in the direction toward wholeness and real life. Like, you can't. If the good life according to the world were really the good life, why is it that so many people we know are miserable? You ever thought of that? If the world, is their version of the good life was really the good life, why is everybody so angry? Why is everybody so miserable? It's because it's not the good life. And deep in your soul, you probably know it. There is only one path forward. There's only one path home. Your soul is longing to be reunited with God. And Jesus has made that possible through his death and his burial and his glorious resurrection. And the good news that is promised to us is that those who believe, those who put their trust in Jesus, will walk in everlasting life when he returns. I don't think we live in a post-truth culture at all. I think we live in a pre-truth culture. Because there's a truth that is going to be revealed one day. Jesus is going to come home. And the entire created order is going to see him for who he truly is. And on that day, according to Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the truth of all things. That day is going to happen, folks. It's coming. And the blessings are for those who can make that confession today by faith, putting their trust in Jesus, the, the one who came full of grace, yes, but also truth. And so would you submit your life to him? Would you make him both your Lord and your Savior? Would you allow him to wash you free from your sins? And then would you be raised to walk in new life, following him in a life of discipleship as we go out on mission into the world to participate in his kingdom building effort? That is the good news of Jesus Christ. The truth will set you free because the truth will guide you home. Today the invitation of Christ is extended Maybe today you want to be like Drew. You want to put Christ on in baptism. I can tell you the water is ready. More importantly, the Lord is ready. Maybe today there's something on your heart you want us to be praying about. We promise to do that too, to join you in that moment, whatever those needs might be. I hope you'll share them with us in these next few moments. In the name of Jesus Christ, the sovereign Lord who makes all things new. He who has ears, let him hear. Let's stand.